Uh, we're back. We're back with some shows. Guys, let's not delay any more. I heard this fucking episode of Gundam was a banger. Uh... Oh. So uh, let's just fucking jump into it. I'm so excited. And yes, you also see that correctly. At 150 followers, I will eat a live tomato. Um, I have not purchased the tomato. I will purchase it when we're getting close to that milestone. <laughs> yes, we can't. We can't leave out the staple. I can. All right, let's do it. This last episode was so fucking good. I'm wondering if this uh, this next one can even top it. Eh, mitomemas. Parakuto wa Gundam ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガンダムです。ガ
what feels very predetermined. Huh. Okay. Non clone Elan. Elon. <laughs> Okay, well, that's an interesting sort of tie-in with the lyrics there. I don't know if I'm totally sold on this theory or not. I mean, it definitely can seem like foreshadowing to have Elan's um, whole narrative wrap up like that. I know he's probably going to come back, but his, his, the character we saw is narrative wrapped up with a, a very narrative-centric idea of kind of phenomenology. Life is what you make it, or life is what you experience. Yeah, about being trapped in the cockpit.ミオリネさんもないんですか？人のことで頭がいっぱいになる。ない。私が考えることはただ一つ。ここから脱出して地球に行くことだけ。あんたも余計なことばっか考えてるとまた実習落ちるよ。どうですけど。So there's something about Miodine that strikes me as interesting. We've talked, we've analyzed her character being very like um, internal locus of control. I'm going to add another layer to that, which is she, she has this very singular focus, right? Like the only thing I care about is getting, getting out of here and getting to Earth. I don't necessarily know why yet. I think it's just... Like, she just, obviously she wants to escape the fate that her, you know, father has kind of impressed on her. But everything that she sort of does wraps around this one single goal. But what she often does, and this is something that you'll see often in, like, psychology, is people looking for miracle solutions. If you're a holistic thinker, right, holistic meaning treating everything as sort of one composite thing, right? Not compartmentalizing life very much, but like, okay, her dream to get to Earth is not just about getting out of here. It's also her key to happiness. It's her key to personal development. It's like a family thing. It's a social thing. It could be a religious thing. It's a financial thing. Like she's wrapped up the idea that getting to Earth is is the miracle solution to all of my problems. It's a very holistic kind of idea. Um, yeah, treating everything as interconnected, but not attending to the interconnected pieces, right? She's, she's a very holistic thinker because she, she's, you can tell because she's looking for a miracle solution. She's like the key to getting out of here and getting out of here is going to solve everything for me is you know to uh like get to let a you know in as my groom and um sort of like get us out of here using politics using gundams whatever holistic thinkers like her tend to they're they struggle to live in the present because she's already 10 steps ahead in her mind like, in her mind, she's already thinking, like, what am I going to do when I get to Earth? But she hasn't dealt with, like, step one, you know? And you'll see this a lot in people um, when they're trying to work through their issues. Is they're like, oh, well, I need to get to this place. It doesn't have to be a physical place, but I need to get here mentally. You know, there's this goal I have. And they're working out the details of that goal, but they, they have stopped really addressing, like, the, the minute steps you need to get there. She can think very holistically, but only for the goal of uh, getting towards Earth. Yeah, it seems like getting to Earth is a miracle solution to her, right? This is what you see with people who, who have like a hundred things juggling in the air, and they're trying to catch them all, right? She's trying to get out of her political situation. She's trying to get out of the relationship situation of, you know, being married to someone she doesn't want. She's trying to get out of her family situation. 
She's trying to get out of her social situation. She doesn't like being in school. And she's trying to um, get into, right, like her whatever goals she wants to unearth. She's taken all of these priorities and wrapped them up as one thing, getting to Earth. And she's blocked off her thinking to, well, I can get out of any of these things by doing something else, right? And I used to think this way too. I'm like, oh, I, I want to go back to Europe, right? Like that's my ultimate goal. And I had my blinders on where I'm just like, oh, well, I have to do this to get there and, and I can only be where I want to be or I can only be happy if I get there, right? So you don't look for any other opportunities to solve your existential issues, your social issues, your family issues. She has pinpointed getting to Earth as the solution to all of it. And she has not started to consider that resolution can be found in these smaller interconnected things. So she's, she's a very holistic thinker in that sense, which is, is not a total drawback. It's just a certain kind of thinking. But beware the person who looks for miracle solutions because they just don't exist. You know, you, you sort of have to take things a little more presently, which I think Suleta is a good foil for her because Suleta is a very present thinker. She's not, well, she, she's worried about like getting back to Mercury and she wants to make like a school there or whatever. But she is thinking about the small steps she needs to take to get there, right? She needs to get her own life together. She wants to go on dates. She wants to have cool nicknames. She wants to go to class. So she's not looking at getting the school built in Mercury as a holistic, single, miracle solution to all of my problems. She's looking at, no, I can solve my social thing by being social. I can solve my relationship thing by going on a date. And these things are connected, but they're not all one mass, which Miodin's headspace is kind of in. <laughs> Throw myself into the ocean. Yeah, maybe that's what I need to do. So I, I, I find their contrast as characters very interesting just from their ways of thinking and how they try to problem solve. I will expect to look out for Miodin making sweeping holistic decisions that are 10 steps away, away from where she is right now. And look at this. Look how cluttered her desk is. It's just like her room filled with trash. <笑>うん。ぶないの社交パーティーみたいなものよ。だいたい学生で参加するの。ご参加くらいのものだしね。こんなのに行ったらホルダーのあんたもステージで挨拶とかさせられちゃって。超気まずいよね。え、ご参加
It's like they're always in the fucking dark. <laughs> the cyber cult. ここはご本人が適任かと。面倒残していきやがった。面白いな。パナムコ。ほら、ええの。魔女なんだろう。なあ、怖い。なんかすっごい見られてるんですけど。気にしない。堂々としてればいいの。でも、背筋を伸ば
I think he'd be a splendid father, right? She's, she, this is like how you get someone to talk, right? She's not, because she, she, she's not looking for information here. Her, her uh, you know, Prospera's goal is not to look for information. She, she, Miodin doesn't know anything that Prospera needs right now. So she's not fishing for answers. She's fishing for, I guess, what I mean is she's not fishing for Miodin to tell her any information. What she's trying to do is observe how does Miodin describe her relationship with her father and what can that tell me for my own political gains? Like how, how can I manipulate this to my advantage, right? So she's, she's not looking for any information. She's setting her up here by saying like, oh, like uh, what, a, what a glorious thing. Everyone knows that's, um, you know, something to be proud of, right? Prospera herself obviously knows, like she's not happy with what happened. Uh, back then. She's like handing out the bait here. Like, oh, I, I think he'd be a splendid father. That's, some that's something Miodin has heard a thousand times, right? And she knows, Prospera knows, that Miodin's heard it so many times and her reaction to it is going to be to try to explain why that's not the case. Also asks her, What's so unforgivable about him, right? Again, she's not looking for information. She knows what's unforgivable. She's looking for to observe the emotional response because that's like the subterfuge. That's, that's the thing that's going to tell her what's a sore spot here. You know, what is like public perception versus like actual perception? So she's so cunning, right? Like she's, she's, hmm. She's fucking sinister, and, and her tactics like are of social manipulation are just very precise. あ、ごめんなさいね。それでは、こちらが初公開となります。ベネリットグループ総裁<笑> ばい。情けない。なんだって兄さんはあんな苦悩な女を。そろそろだ。指示通りにな。はい、父さん。ガンダムズアニメアフターオン。ゲーム。はい、これ。大丈夫。レッドフラッグ。レッドフラッグ flags。Red flags on that boy. When are we going to see some more of Cathedra? よかったらどうぞ。ありがとうございます。He's way too fucking smooth. Hey. Yo. Smooth boy. Don't play that fucking sad music shit. かなかったから、その私心配で僕の方こそ君に謝らなきゃってずっと思ってた。いや、I having any red flags that his personality is completely fucking different like 
<laughs> Will he fall for the tomato's charms? I don't know. I don't know if they'll play that card again. She's too naive. Yeah, this is like the second guy she met. ご来場の皆様、ここからは特別プレゼンターとしてペイルテクノロジーズCEOの皆様にご登壇いただきます。本日はアスティカシア高等専門学園の 将来有望なる生徒さんを皆様にご紹介できますこと大変光栄に存じますWhat? How did she get there? それでは改めてご紹介しましょう弊社の誇るモビルスーツファラクトのパイロットエランケレスI thought that fucking suit got blown up 先日の決闘でそのファラクトを見事に撃破したゲンホルダーでもあるスレッタ・マーキュリーさんですスレッタ・マーキュリーですああ私にとってこの国にも学びがたくさんって自分でね捨てます Oh, she's so adorable. She's going to be so traumatized. とても有力ですけど操縦には複雑な技術を要するのではなくてそれともあなたの才能かしらエアリアルがすごいんだってエアリアルはこれあなたは絶対育った大切な家族ですから Hey, yo, DP. DP, you're so right. This isn't gonna end well. This is gonna end with so much trauma. Welcome to the stream, by the way. Senjitsnoketochufshinakankakunatayohadashiga. いつもより声聞こえた気がするこいおりますとなるほど間違いありませんねおっこれではっきりしましたもう新生開発公社のモビルスーツエアリアルはガンダムですわいわっ don't act so fucking surprised how did they plan her to be standing like on this platform? It's so dramatic. I love it. Yeah, what's their fucking game plan here to out her like this? And does this fall into Prospera's sort of plans, I wonder? This is the kind of camp I love, yeah. If I'm Prospera, right, and I'm and I'm thinking like, you know, 30 steps ahead, and I got my daughter into this university for her to become the holder, it's probably a part of her plan that the gunned format gets exposed for what it is. And she likely already knows about the shadow organization people that we're looking at. There's been no sign of her being like a step behind in any of this so far. Like she's she's really thinking many, many steps ahead. This has been revealed to us, meaning, oh no, we didn't know about it. Yeah. I mean they suspected it. They suspected it from the beginning that it was a Gundam. <laughs> We know your machine is a Gundam because ours is a Gundam. So they're they're not trying to out her for having a Gundam because they're also saying we have one too. 
what is their fucking game plan? And how did they plan this fucking <laughs> this dramatic pylon raising? It's amazing. <laughs> Oh, they're supposing they didn't know their thing was a Gundam. Well, yeah. Suleta so doesn't think of hers as a Gundam. But she probably also doesn't... I mean, she probably is aware. Probably aware that the Gundams are illegal. But she's probably not tuned into why. Like, she doesn't know the whole uh, Vanadis incident. Is Prosperous game plan here to reveal somehow that actually Ariel isn't a Gundam? Ariel is a um, mobile suit amalgamation of my cyber child, Ari. So it's technically not a Gundam, it's actually a human. There's so, like, so she's not violating any sort of accord. If we, if we are going with the theory that uh, Ariel is Ari, that this is, that this is a Gundam cyber child, right? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that break their case against like, oh, this thing fits the definition of, of a Gundam, which is illegal. It's technically a human. なんでしょう。会場の外でないとできないお話。力の伝言です。例の剣の再取引を Let's go fucking Mio time. エアリアルはペイル社にも絶対者にも勝った優秀な機体よ。あの子の花嫁だからよ。えいや。ミオリネ、そう。問題を吐き違えていらっしゃるよう。パイロットの命を奪う非人道兵器を認めるわけにはいきません。スレッタはピンピンしてるじゃない。ただ否定して排除することし
this is such a a sweeping gesture of political financial uh like social intermarital fucking like educational bioethical humanitarian uh technological fucking all of these things like she she is such a a holistic thinker in in every facet and again i would never say that like that's that's a wrong way to think right but if you're doing some sort of therapy work with someone and you're working on you know personal development you would look at someone's quality like this and think like this is their box that they think in and how do we think outside of it well it would be to compartmentalize a little more because i don't think that this is going to go down super well for her <laughs> it makes sense to her right internal locus of control that's how she, she thinks that like this master plan completely makes sense to her but that's because she's not just thinking about it as one thing she's thinking about it as a hundred different things and it's she's thought about the development of it in all of these various stages from like concept to application but it's like trying to explain something that you've thought through very deeply to someone who you're just is just being introduced to it like they're lacking fundamental knowledge they they are lacking the initiation that they need to even accept the idea of letting someone build a fucking gundam right because that was the whole like vanadis incidents appeal was like this is a technological nightmare because it's unethical so she's not appealing to the ethics part of it she's appealing to the financial part of it and saying we'll solve the ethical problem yeah the cathedra agreement She's appealing to the financial and, and saying the ethical stuff will fall into line. But she knows what to press on, which is which is their... <laughs> Why is the agreement name cool? I know, it's fucking cool. <laughs> Cathedra is like one of those things I look at and I'm like, fuck, I wish I would have come up with that. It's, it's fucking cool. Now, this is outside the scope of prediction for someone like Prospera, right? She could not have guessed that Miodin would make some sort of proposal like this, but she knows a little bit more about the politics of this stuff to say that it's not likely this is going to go through. But I'm wondering if some partial level of it could go through. I guess it comes down to what is what is Miodin's uh, father... What pressure does he have to let her sort of like let loose with this idea? Don't stand on the platform. No one's going to drop fucking cash into that. Wait, it's a, she's like beamed it to their cash apps. <laughs> That's so great. She's like, cash at me this 240 million. Oh, sweetie, I, I don't think so. Because you're thinking about it way too much like a miracle solution and this honestly happens in politics where people are like oh well we need this this key thing in in the political space will solve everything else it'll solve a humanitarian crisis a financial crisis a ecological crisis but people most people are not so diabolical and and forward thinking so you can't appeal to everything at once because not everyone in the room is you and now everyone thinks like you. She has to appeal to all these different parties and all their different personal investment strategies. She, what, another word for holistic in this sense would be very utilitarian, right? The most benefit for the most amount of people. She, her proposal is very utilitarian in a psychological sense which makes a lot of sense like theoretically but in practice no one's gonna fucking go for it <laughs> everyone in the room should be me exactly why why can't you all just be me Tsukiyo Tsumori wa nai. 
Don't stand on the platform. He's going <laughs> to evacuate you. Oh, shit. Heels off. Fucking girl boss time. まずはその可愛い字を捨てなくちゃね。ですから。ベネリットグループの総裁である。あなたの信用をお借りしたいんです。お願いします。逃げるなよ。お前が考えてる以上にガンダムの Three percent, huh? Hey, yo, who the fuck is cash apping her this much? What? <laughs> the, a, the business successfully formed. I love that this fucking app, like, has this built in. <laughs> and it would announce, like, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a fucking kickstarted with, uh, 240 billion space bucks. My god. What are her stretch goals? This is <laughs> such a great fucking campy ass scene. <laughs> What? And they set up the stage for this? They set up the stage for something they didn't know would happen? To... <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> this show is so good. It's like so particular about the details of like... <laughs> the politics and 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 the and the narrative therapy and and the psychology and then it just <laughs> and it just drops these like moments of complete schlock. How would they know that Suleta is going to stand there on the stage for her to dramatically shoot up on the spire to be exposed like that? And were the same people who designed that mechanism aware that Miodin? <laughs> <laughs> would set up a fucking GoFundMe for a fucking space business to to shoot fireworks off when it is successfully funded, when none of this was known beforehand. This is amazing. <laughs> Yo, what's up, Wupe? Oh my god. What else? What else are we expecting here? Are people going to cheer? They didn't give a shit two seconds ago, but they see the fireworks. I think they're going to cheer. え、みんな。お見事。風向き変わりそうね。ええ。やはり認めた。What? Wait, what? Did she predict this too? How? Uh, I my my brain is broken right now. The fucking 5D chess on display here. Her entire scheme is about getting people to accept Gundam. How could she have did she play Miodin into this as well? Does she, maybe she maybe she has like hacking abilities and she knew about Miodin's business scheme 
And that's why she was trying to get that emotional reaction out of her before. It's not it's not necessarily like like I said, she wasn't trying to get information. She's trying to provoke something. Jaturk was trying to buy up the Mercury Company. My God, she's she's so far ahead of the curve, this fucking Prospera. You had some fucking business to attend to? That's not business, that's fucking, like, <laughs> some crazy ass, like, political and uh, corporate espionage. Or what? She say daughters? Daughters plural? Oh no. Oh no. Oh no, no. Oh no. I don't want it to be true. I don't want it to be true. Every episode, this this theory gets more and more cred credible. And now that we looked at the fucking song lyrics as well. I mean, I guess she could still be talking about Ariel as like a, you know, her child, like her, her, her creation. Nah, I'm just fucking, like, I'm on the fucking copium now. Like, that's... <laughs> Ariel's family. Ariel is a fucking dead cyber child made into a Gundam. But I still think that Prospera's ultimate goal here is not just revenge. I think that's way too simplistic. I think it's way too... It's way too linear of a thought process for someone as cunning and like forward thinking as her. She doesn't just want revenge for what happened in the prologue. I'm curious if we mined the prologue for more information, we would have some some better idea about existentially what is what is meaningful to Prospera. Because it's not just getting revenge. It's not just having political and financial influence, and it's not just raising Suleta and Ariel to be, you know, uh, I guess, like, successful children of hers. What is the most meaningful thing to her, right? That's the, that's the question I would have for a character like this if I were doing um, some sort of, like, existential therapy. And it's not a simple question as why are you doing this, right? It's it's why is this meaningful to you? Why is this something you can't live without? No, I don't think it is her daughters because she's willing to use them as like uh, political pieces, you know, to play this game. I'm very curious what what other traumas this character might have been through that that really influence her. And it could just simply be as simple as um, she grew up with with nothing, you know, being someone from Mercury, like it's sort of a backwater in this universe, in this fiction. And to sort of demonstrate that like her upbringing was, was valuable. You know what this could be? Let's put this into terror management theory lens, okay? Terror management theory, fundamentally the idea is... The fear of death is is the reason for everything that we do. But it's not fear of dying, okay? I want to be clear on that. Because because people may not be afraid of dying or or not being alive anymore. The fear of death is an existential thing. It's a cultural thing. Terror management theory suggests that the reason we create cultures and contribute to them is because we know we're going to die, right? Your awareness of death is called your mortality salience, okay? Mortality salience. This is a term. Mortality salience, the awareness by individuals that their death is, is inevitable. It's from terror management theory, which proposes that mortality salience exists, that causes existential anxiety that may be buffered 
by an individual's cultural worldview and or sense of self-esteem. So mortality salience, right? New term to spam. What I'm getting at here is you are a living individual. You are aware that you are going to die. That is your mortality salience. This causes existential anxiety, right? Mortality salience causes existential anxiety. It may be buffered or dealt with, right? To be buffered means like to be um, kind of pushed aside by an individual's cultural worldview or in her sense for self-esteem. So the cultural worldview in terror management terms, hey, what's up, Rex? How's it going? Um, in, in terror management theory terms, the cultural worldview is, is your way of dealing with the inevitability of death. So I know I'm going to die. And what I really am looking for, because I, I, can't, I can't survive past my corporeal end, is I'm looking for something that will give me symbolic immortality. Okay, symbolic immortality is the goal. How do we get symbolic immortality? Well, we could have a child, right? That's, that's a legacy that we could um, develop. We could create something of important value, right? Something with strong instrumental purpose. We're trying to, to find something that can stand in our place when we are no longer around. Right, that that contains facets of our identity. Right, it's not just about a legacy; it's about symbolic immortality. Something that, okay, like maybe I create something, maybe I write a book, maybe I write a song, right? Something that represents me when I'm not here anymore. But that's still a small scale. The cultural worldview is the large scale version of this. So my culture, the stronger my culture is the longer I'm going to be around and achieve this kind of symbolic immortality. Because if you're in my culture and you create something of significant instrumental purpose or value, that becomes a part of me as well. So terror management theory suggests that contributing to your culture is your way of dealing or buffering with this existential anxiety caused by mortality salience. So I'm afraid of death. I'm afraid of dying. I'm afraid of life not mattering. I better contribute to something that's going to stay when I'm not here. My culture is the biggest and most accessible thing to that. Maybe I'll have a kid. Maybe I'll uh, write a book. Maybe I'll, you know, do something for social work, whatever. <clears throat> I want to contribute to that in some way. Well, now we get into what happens when your cultural worldview is threatened by someone else's. So the existence of a second culture or other cultures is automatically a threat to your culture. Because, well, right, it could dominate, and any culture who is more profoundly uh, sustainable than yours works its way back up to the thing I'm contributing to will not last after me. I won't get my symbolic mortality. Life has no meaning. I'm going to die without, you know, having a legacy. So terror management theory's idea is like, this is why cultures do not get along with each other, fundamentally. Fundamentally, that's why they're competitive, right? We're all, we're all having this existential fear of individual personalized at death. This can explain why sports teams don't like each other, right? I'm afraid of death. Culture is the thing that's going to protect me from it. My sports team is a minuscule uh, representation of my culture, my local culture, my local sports team. So when yours beats mine, it works its way back up the chain to fear of death, fear of dying, fear of not sticking around, culture is threatened, uh, you know, I'm going to die without meaning. Uh, so uh, when your guy kicks the ball into my net, that makes me fucking pissed, right? Terror management theory, again, it's a very holistic theory because it's trying to explain everything by one principle, fear of death, mortality salience. Everything we do is driven by uh, this existential dread. So when I think about this character, when I think about um, Prospero, World Cup riots, exactly. When I think about Prospero and what her goals are existentially, I'm, and I think terror management, this is, this is about like 
growing up in the culture she was raised, in the Mercurian culture, it is extremely under threat by the Pell group. And like, right there, their biggest achievement for symbolic immortality was the Gundam, right? That's the thing that they created that was going to outlast even their culture. We can create something of significant instrumental purpose. This will outlast us. So they create this thing, this Gundam, but they're told it's illegal to make this thing. It's unethical. It's, uh, you know, not sustainable. This is not just their creative or technological work being undermined. It is their cultural worldview at stake. And so this works its way back to fear of death. Like Prospera is on the individual level. I must achieve symbolic immortality. That's what we're always, that's what all of us are fighting for. My culture is my avenue for that. The Gundam is our significant cultural representation. When that's at stake, the culture is at stake. When the culture is at stake, the meaning of my life is at stake. She said the Gundam for the gun format saved her life in the prologue. Exactly. Like it is not just attached to their creative or technological ambitions. This is existential dread. She does rely on the gun to survive. Like it's a very humanitarian sort of goal. Right? And and then we can get into the particulars of like what is it about the thing your culture creates or contributes? Is it for example, your your culture is, you know, uh, not a technological or a social or political powerhouse, but it has the best fucking sports team, right? Like that's powerful. You know, there there are lots of like economically poor countries with like phenomenal sports teams, and like that's the thing that they want to invest in because their cultural worldview is at stake. That's their symbolic immortality, and every individual person, when they have their mortality salience check, that's what they look at and say. I'm not able to contribute something personally that's going to change the world, so I can contribute by being, being a fan of something that is on a global scale, and that puts us in a position of power. Because the longer we do that, the more our culture will be around. The more our culture will be around, the more I will be alive when I'm dead. I fucking love terror management theory because it is, I, it, I am a holistic thinker myself, right? And, and I tend to um, try to understand not just why do people do something, but existentially, what's the purpose? And the fear of death makes sense to me. Again, sometimes I bring that up and people are like, well, I'm not afraid of dying. It's not a fear of dying. It is a fear of your life not having meaning. You know, fear of being forgotten. And death is just the, the catalyst for that. Personally, I think it's the reason I do basically anything, why I want to write fiction, why I want to, you know, uh, develop a psychological theory, why I want to write music, why I want to contribute in any way to my own personal cultural worldview is because, like, I ain't going to be here forever. I want something to represent me when I'm gone, you know? Um and I think we all have like a natural inclination to do something like that. For Suleta, it's very experiential right now. Not thinking about things in broad existential terms. She's not focused on legacy because that's not her uh, psychosocial crisis. Remember, we talked about the psychosocial crises, the Eric Erickson model, right? Miodin and Suleta are sort of in like a uh, autonomy versus... Um, industry i think it is or whatever the the stage is but like prospera she's very much in the generativity versus stagnation phase of life she's very concerned with this mortality salience where <laughs> where does my robot models play into this <laughs> okay why do we like things like gunpla there's a minor manifestation of your creative skill in putting together a model, right? The more we create or, or display artifacts of our own interests, right? This is why we put models together and we put them up on our house. We don't put them in a box. We don't build it and then put it away. We put it up because we want to be reminded of the thing we're interested in. Well, why are we interested in it? We're interested in it because 
the television show or the aesthetic or something captivates us. And it captivates us because we know that something like Gundam is going to be around, you know, longer than we are. And we can invest in other cultures, the same as our own, right? We can invest in Japanese culture um, as a sort of collective check against mortality salience. That if I invest in this thing, if I remind myself of the interest I have in it, if I display an artifact of it, in a way I am preventing some amount of mortality salience or, or uh, death anxiety. Um, by doing that, I want my body pillow because it shows my wife who taking skills as a symbolic de deterrence against death. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> now that I've explained this, you guys are going to be like trying to filter everything. The reason I love terror management theory is because you can look at any minor weird little thing that people do and try to try to filter it through this perspective. There is some level of everything we do about contributing to a cultural worldview, and we do that because it will be, make us symbolically immortal. How does this apply to people who, due to some level of neurodivergence, aren't as at or, or at all aware of perceptive of culture? So culture, in this case, does not necessarily mean um, national interest. Culture does not necessarily mean your your nationality, right? Like I'm not I'm not invested in my own personal nationality. I I don't care about this country really, right? Like I don't even want to live here anymore. Um, but that's because I grew up in a different culture, right? I didn't grow up in America really as an adult. So my cultural worldview is not geolocational. Your cultural worldview, especially now that we're like a very globalized world. Includes anything that you're invested in. For example, for us, it's anime, right? Culture doesn't need awareness. It's just what people do. Yeah, I mean, your culture could be like, your cultural worldview could consist of the shows you watch, the people you uh, surround yourself with, the interests you have. It's not, it's not culture in the uh, nationality sense. It could be. It very well could be. But... Like, you know, Japanese anime and and iconography, right? The Gundam models are part of my cultural worldview now because I'm interested in them. And by contributing to them in some way, like I'm venting myself from existential dread. So you don't necessarily need awareness of culture as culture. Um, it's sort of whatever you surround yourself with. You update your regular, your analyst accounts, anime list accounts, to showcase your anime watching skills as a symbolic sign. <laughs> God damn it. Guys, it, it, there is a reason. We all do it. Yeah, when enough people do something, it becomes a culture, right? The more, the more people who validate this cultural worldview, the more protected it is, right? That's why other cultures are a threat to our own. And culture, again, not national culture, but um, the more people who contribute to whatever your cultural worldview is, the more protected it is from existential death. The idea that some can't comprehend important aspects of this theory. Yeah, no, I, I agree that... I mean, the idea of terror management theory is that this is all at its such a deep subconscious level that we don't really think about it. Like, the person who's getting, who gets upset when their soccer team when someone else's soccer team like kicks a ball into their net they're not thinking this challenges my worldview and and now I, i'm going to die and life has no meaning right like they're not connecting it in that way it's at a very abstract and subconscious level so you don't have to be aware of it for it to be valid analysis i would say for those who are aware of it it is useful to know yeah you don't have to comprehend to participate it, it, it's happening naturally you know, it's it's happening in the same way that just like uh, sociology happens naturally, your psychological development happens naturally. You know, you don't you don't actively think about yourself going through the Oedipus phase of your childhood sexual development. It just it's a it's a latent f function um, that happens automatically. And terror management theory is what is one of those where 
you naturally invest in your culture, your culture being whatever it is, your school, your team, your friend group, you know, whatever shows you like, that's, that's part of your cultural worldview. Um, so yeah, you don't have to be super aware of it. But that's my breakdown of this character and what I think she's really after. Because I don't think it's, I don't think it's as simple as she wants this thing. She wants revenge. She wants Earth. She wants, uh, you know, whatever. She doesn't want anything. What she, what she's looking for is, is to avoid the collapse of her cultural worldview, because it gives her so much existential dread down to a literal level that she she actually relies on this format this gun format to survive and it is not just a technical thing but it is like this is the this is the thing that her culture has manifested and made meaningful and so of course she wants that to carry on and everything in her way is just a play piece including her own fucking child that's how strong the uh, existential dread is so that's that's <laughs> that's a fucking that's a fucking analysis of this character right there, backed up by a whole fucking theory. <laughs> Actually, <sighs> Guys, this show is so fucking good. It's so it's so layered. Question for those of you mostly Eldress and, and Dark Thug, who have seen the other Gundam shows. Is this is this level of uh, depth typical? Because like I'm going to watch the rest of the Gundam series. We're going to watch it on stream. I know I haven't watched. I know we haven't continued. We have watched like the first episode of the original series. My goal is to watch the whole fucking show on stream eventually. Um, but is this like, is this new territory for this series? I think even without this level of analysis, there's a lot here. This is actually really good. A very strong start even among the Gundams. Huh. This show has everything. It has like the fucking camp. It has the cool robots. It has like the uh, great characters. It has the waifus. It has the husbandos. And it has like deep existential, psychological, and political conflicts. Yeah, I, I, I really see this like going to the fucking stratosphere. And the best part is like this show is so interesting and there's been like three Gundam fights. Uh, aside from the prologue, there's been like three Gundam fights and they've all been duels. Like they've been, the stakes have not been very high, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Which is amazing to me, like how how much it's keeping interest by having nothing to do with Gundams shooting each other, basically. It's fucking fascinating. This is I guess this is the result of like developing a show, you know, over fucking what? Forty years? Nineteen seventy nine? It's the reality of Gundam. Yeah, I'm super fucking into this show and series. There's just so much. There's so much here. Well, that was uh, Gundam. Mobile Suit Gundam. The Witch from Mercury, Episode 7. 